Well, tonight we're going to begin our study on the doctrine of transformation, and one of the foundational verses for that teaching is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read it off the handout here for the sake of uh, time. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Hyphen. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Glory to God, the reading of the Holy Scriptures. I'll walk you through here very briefly. It starts out with a strong exhortation. I urge you. Anytime you see verily, verily, or I urge you in the Scripture, pay close attention. In other words, the Scripture through the Holy Spirit is exhorting us to, 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 to pay extra attention. I urge you, brothers, in view, and then it says of what? View of what? God's mercy. According to the Scriptures, God punishes sin. According to the Scripture, sin the definition, the biblical definition of sin, I've heard it missing the mark. I've heard uh, many other paraphrases of what the biblical definition of sin is. According to 1 John, if you're taking notes, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, 5, and 6, sin equals lawlessness. Sin equals lawlessness. In summary, God has established the laws that govern the earth, God has established the spiritual laws to govern mankind. Out of, out of sheer experience and teaching, um, and innate, like a, 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 God gives us the senses to know when something is going to hurt you. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. We, don't, we, you know, we don't walk up to a fire and put our hand in it. Why? Mm-hmm. Because we, we have this ability to understand that this would hurt us. God has established the laws of the earth, and they govern everything in regards to the natural laws. And out of just sheer experience and teaching, we respect those, don't we? Yes. We understand that if you walk into a room full of propane and you light a match, you're going to end your life. Yeah. We understand if you walk out in front of an RTA bus, you're, the, the law of uh, physics is going to crush you, Yes. Yes. The laws do not bend for man. Man must heed and submit to the laws that God has established that govern the earth. Agreed? Yes. So, out of experience, uh, sometimes out of pain, um, we heed and respect the laws of the earth. God has also established the Holy Scriptures and given us commands and direction, given us guidance and understanding. Because he knows everything about you, and he knows how the spiritual laws should be applied in your life so that you can benefit from them, yes? And so that only happens if you honor them. And so the teaching I have from Jesus in James chapter 4, verse 7, if you're keeping notes, that's not on the handout. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, submit. Submit to God. The form of submission means that you would surrender to his will by choice. In other words, God doesn't make robots, right? He does not make robots in the form of humans. He gives us the volition of our will, and we exercise that in recognition that he is worthy of obedience. Yes. That equals love. So back to um, sin, the biblical definition of sin is lawlessness. In other words, zero submission to divine authority. Zero submission to divine authority. Now, it, 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 it teaches us that God punishes sin and that the wages of sin, you all have heard it a thousand times or more, that the, the payment for disobedience to God or the payment for lawlessness is death. 
And so we must accept that, that God punishes sin and that the wages of sin is death. Agreed? So when this text is pointing to, it says in view of God's mercy, God wants you to understand that you have the sentence of eternal death on you. It was on your head because you inherited Adam's endemic sinful nature. No one, no one taught the, the six-year-old to lie. He just started lying. And then he would go and steal his brother's milk, right? It's just the sinful nature is inherited from our forefather, Adam. Christ came with grace, truth, and mercy. And Jesus, in his loving kindness on Calvary's cross, paid what the law required for sin. Death. Christ died on Calvary's cross and he paid what was due according to the law for mankind's sins. Now, God's willing to forgive. And when you come and receive Christ, the value of the blood of Jesus Christ is appropriated to your sinful debt. And it's, it's wiped through the value of Jesus' blood. In other words, God has established that only the blood of Jesus is the acceptable sacrifice for all mankind's sins. Yes. Nothing else will do. Because nothing else is heaven down. Yes. Nothing else is holy. Nothing else is pure. And so God is, is willing and has been willing and was willing to accept the blood of His Son as sufficient and, and full payment for all mankind's sin. So that's what the Lord wants you to recognize here. He wants us to recognize that he gave all so that your sin debt was wiped clean out of mercy uh, as a gift of mercy. And it came by way of Jesus Christ on a cross. And so the Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10, that that you've been saved by grace through faith. Okay? So when you put your faith in Christ... And you say, I trust that what you did has been accepted by the Father. And I acknowledge that you are Lord in Christ. And I also believe that you were crucified for my sins. And that God accepted your crucifixion as payment in full for my sin debt. And that God himself raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. And when you announce that, God says, that's enough. What have I done? I just gave you a declaration of my faith in God of my faith in Christ. And when you do that, the Bible says that that is sufficient and that God, in the same way that uh, Abraham's belief was accredited to him as righteousness, such is the same for us who put our faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So there you go in Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2, is pointing, in other words, he's saying in view, in view of the mercy that you have past tense received, Assuming you're in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Assuming you're in Christ, the premise. He's saying, in view of that, the the expected response to that is offer your body. Mm -hmm. You think, I'm not... How could God use me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can assure you, There is an exhaustive, detailed plan in Scripture on how God has set forth before the foundations of the world that He would use you. And it's in Ephesians chapter 2, if you're taking notes, verse 10. It says that there is a pre-planned good work that you, listen closely, that you should do. There is a pre-planned good work that you, say it with me, should, should do. It doesn't say you will do. It says you should do. In other words, he's leaving it to you to decide to remember the mercies that you've received. And, and the natural response, according to what we've just read, is that you would willingly come to Almighty God and say, God, I could not have saved myself. I would have died in my sin On this day, on this day, on this day, and on that day, and even when I didn't know it, there were perils abounding toward me. In view of all those times, whether it be from 
foolishness on my side or old age, at some point I would have died in my sin and I, I would have paid my sin debt myself forever. But I thank you, Lord, that Jesus rescued me. I thank you, Lord, that you have sent him to rescue me from my sins and that you have sent him to pay my sin debt. And I choose this day to offer my body in, in response to such an unbelievable, immeasurable gift of God. Okay? So, when you look at it this way, the natural response is, Lord, everything I have is yours. My time, my money, my resources, my energies, my intellect, my children, my house, everything is yours. Put it to work. You're the master HR manager. So here I am, Lord, use me. Agreed? So that's what's expected is all in. Oh, if you read Romans 12, 1 and 2, he's saying all in, not half in, because nothing less will do. Christ didn't get up and get off, get up and get off on the cross. No, all in. Okay, so that's what the, the exhortation from Romans 12, 1 is. Now, if you move on down through there, it says that this all in and the use of your body to, toward the, you have to have a kingdom mindset, Right? Jesus scolded Peter like anything and spoke to Satan that was at work through Peter and said, get thee behind me. Uh, You you do not have your mind on the things of God. You've got your mind on the things of the world. Whew. Can you imagine how that felt to him? In other words, he had lost his way and he was standing next to Jesus. Right? He had really lost his way. How much more then should we be sensitive to discern and yearn for the will of God. Yes. We should, we must, yeah. it has to be like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Because that way your mind is steadfast, your heart is longing. It's like, it, the, it's okay to want Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's not okay to long for the world. Yeah. Amen? And the pleasures thereof. Yeah. So it, it, God says that when you're all in, when your body's all in, your mind's all in, your, your, your willingness is there, free will, that that becomes your spiritual act of worship. In other words, it's very physical. But it's the submission to Christ that makes it acceptable. And therefore, it becomes an act of worship. Because you're coming to Christ and, and, and serving with all that you have to the glory of God and for no other reason. That's the spiritual act of worship. So he... He gives us that right out of the gate in verse 1. And then it it stops, period. It says, do not conform. This is where the volition of the will has to be exercised daily. And that's the reason the mind must be trained. The mind must be trained to know what God accepts and what he detests. To know what he has uh, declared as acceptable forms of behavior and it's not so much it is behavior but it's the spirit behind the behavior you know sometimes you can follow the letter to the law or the letter of the law to the letter and and be planets away your heart can be planets away it's when your heart is leading by the holy spirit on the inside and you're saying you know, he is so worthy. I, what else can I do but worship him? What else can I do except look forward to heaven's glory? What else can I do except lay this life down that I might have the exchange of life as Christ offered in his life and laid his life down that I too may lay this life down and have that exchange of life and that the life I live, I no longer live for myself or by myself, but the life I live, I live by faith in the crucified Jesus the Christ. Yes. Amen. Galatians 2.20 for those that are taking notes. So let me encourage you today that that is acceptable, that that, that will position you to be able to have discernment, and that, that you'll be able to understand what his good, his pleasing, and perfect will is. Now, let me just unpack that last, that last part of Romans 12 to be quickly. Listen to me. Catch this. You have the declared will of God right here in your hands. 
the declared will of God, the written word of God, the absolute perfect, inerrant, holy word of God, given by the Holy Spirit through the holy prophets, it's in your hand, correct? Yes. Everything you do, we need to run through the filter of submission to Christ. And all of the time that you have, your T-I-M-E, is something that must be stewarded or it'll get away from you. And you'll spend it lavishly on things that just don't matter eternally. So one of the, the keys to walking in the kingdom is that you would walk in accordance with the kingdom mindset, right? And in order to do that successfully, this word must become one with you. And as a result of this word becoming one with you, the Bible teaches, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, but be transformed. Now, you, when you think about that, think about the potter and the piece of clay. Okay? There's beautiful pottery. You know, you might have a, a special piece in your house, or you know somebody that collects beautiful china and stuff. It didn't start out like that. It started out with a hunk of clay. Right? And the potter very carefully worked it. And worked it put water on it, molded it, and shaped it, and then put it in hot fire. And then it became a piece of glamorous china, right? Or ceramic. Such is the case with God's children. He's working on us. He's not done yet. That, that, that working that's going on in your life is God working to transform us. And he does require our intentional participation. You say, what might that be? The intentional participation is your belief. Let me say it again. It's your belief. That is the work of God. Romans 6, St. John 6, 28, 29. This is the work of God. What must I do to do the works of God, 28 says. And, it, and the response was, this is the works. This, let me, I got it backwards. Let me correct myself. They came to Jesus and said, what must I do to do the works of God. His response was, this is the work, singular, that you would believe in the one whom he sent. Right? So, in order to do the works of God, you must have the foundation to do the work of God, which is belief, childlike belief, that Jesus is Lord, that God's word is pure, and that he's got his hand on you, and that he's going to finish what he started in you, and he's going to take you from heaven to earth. And you know not when that might be. It's in that mindset that transformation takes place because your mind is wholeheartedly on Christ. On Christ. Jesus told Martha and Mary, there's really only one thing needed, ladies. And it shall not be taken from her. What was she doing? What was Mary doing? Staring into his eyes. Listening to his voice saturating her herself with the teachings from Jesus firsthand. Okay? It's in that way that you'll be transformed. Because Jesus will minister to you, and His Word will minister to you, and the consequence of both those things working, and your response to Him through prayer, and your obedience as, an act of, as, a, as a natural response, and your view of the mercies that you've received, all work together to make you a willing, productive Disciple in light of your knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and Christ. Amen? So with that said, there's your foundation as far as the doctrine of transformation. If you go to section one, a bird's eye view of God's divine plan to mold and shape each one of his children, we begin here by, by, by reading Ephesians chapter one, verse four and five. It's on the front page of the handout. I want you to understand that you were known by God before you arrived on earth. Psalms 39 verses 13 through 16 teaches us that God's thoughts are many towards you in Psalms 139. God God knew you before you arrived in Psalms 139, right? It's like he spoke to the prophet Jeremiah. I knew you before you were born. So there's there's a process here. You've been sent to earth to represent Christ for a season. And at the end of the season, you'll return from where you came. And what you do with the time here on earth is completely up to you. You have to choose in light of the mercies that you received, in light of his worth that you know is true, in light of his greatness 
This is the natural response. Complete submission, eager hearts, pure hearts, eager hands, diligent, thoughtful minds in complete submission under the leadership, headship of Christ, under the guidance day-to-day, minute-by-minute of the the precious Holy Spirit who lives inside the born-again believer. So so here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, in other words, I, I put a header above it, and it says, His divine choice is a landmark. In, in your lifetime, you'll have spiritual landmarks. Your acceptance of Christ. Your, your water baptism, right? Your, your, uh, your education would be a landmark. Uh, going in, uh, leaving your parents, landmark. Uh, there is a natural landmark stepping stones in life, Correct. So, so is it with the spiritual dimension. And God's divine choice is a landmark in our transformation process. You'll see it here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. It says, The Lord in his awesome omniscient power has known before the foundations of the world who would accept his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can see a glimpse of this glorious truth as we meditate on Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. For the sake of expedience, I've I've typed it out for you. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with with his pleasure and will. All glory to God. Yes? So here... It's not by accident that you heard the gospel. That was granted to you. It's not by accident that, 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 that you had the opportunity to hear the glorious gospel, but you had to exercise your will to believe it. And that is not, it, it, God positioned you and gave you the opportunity to believe. And then the Holy Spirit moved on you and your confession of your belief came out of your mouth. You confess that Jesus is Lord. You confess that he was buried. You confess that he was raised on the third day. Such as those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. Yes? Yeah. So, that, is that not a landmark? Yeah. Is not receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior the most important thing you've ever done in your earthly life? Yeah. Yeah. No question. Is the water baptism the second most important thing you'll ever do in your life? Without question. Yes? Yeah. So, spiritual landmarks. Here on section one, continue on page two. Turn over there with me, please. As we can clearly see in the Word of God, the Lord Himself has already exercised His divine providence in mandating those that have received adoption through His one and only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, are chosen to walk in holiness. Let me tell you something. You're not likely to get an angel to, w- to wake you up out of bed every morning, hold your hand, put you in front of the Word, get your Cheerios for you, and then stay by your side all day long, saying, no, stop there, go up, turn left, up, go right. But God makes it that kind of counsel available to you through the precious Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming inside of you is there as a helper. Can you believe that God, knowing that we need help, would send the helper? And how do you develop a relationship without communication? Prayer is the lifeline for a disciple. Prayer must be in your life. You must petition God the Father through Christ the Son for daily guidance. Who's he going to dispatch? He's going he's to allow the Holy Spirit who's already inside of you to say, stop there, hold up, turn here. Go left, go right. It's not the work of angels. It's the work of the blessed Holy Spirit is my point. And your cooperation is so important that, and it begins by your desire. Mm -hmm. According to your desire, let it be so to you. Mm -hmm. (coughs) You, Some of you have been here a long time. You've heard me talk about the ladder. Picture a ladder, and at the base of it is your longing and your, your yearning for Christ at the base of it. What does that do? That expression of faith, that longing for Him, opens up the door for the Lord to reveal Himself to you. How does He do that? He grants you understanding of the revelation of God through the Word of God. 
the Lord Jesus reveals His Word to you, the Holy Spirit works a work on the inside of you, and you, you just one fine morning you wake up and you're like, wow, i never seen that before. I've read that three times. Yeah, I never got that before. <coughs> What's happening there? The Holy Spirit in His teaching ministry is granting you understanding for your good and for the glory of God. Yes? All right. So at the base of the ladder, picture your desire. And the desire leads to the revelation. The revelation, what does that do? It creates faith. Now I'm on the third step of the ladder. This faith is something that is required for all believers to walk in. It's by faith, that, by grace through faith that you're saved, right? It's by faith that you please God. These are all tools, especially in the warfare realm. Because it's the faith of the saints that extinguishes the fiery darts of of Satan. It's the faith of the saints in the person of Jesus Christ that God requires for you to receive the gift of righteousness by way of Jesus, by way of gift. And so now on the third ladder, your faith expressed, what does it do? It creates obedience. It's, it's your, it's, it all began way down here for the longing of your heart. The longing of your heart to know Him. The longing of your heart to be to be thrilled by understanding His greatness. Right? Understanding His greatness. And then, you, we're on the faith ladder, right? Right? And faith produces what? Obedience. Obedience to who? Obedience to the Lord. Obedience to His Word. And what does that do? It, it, the last ring on this ladder, it equals love for God. There it is. Begins at the base of the ladder, with that longing to know Him, yes. and then right on up, the, right on up it goes. Yeah. They're inseparable. That that ladder I just pitched to you yeah. is absolutely inseparable yeah. for productivity in Jesus Christ yeah. and peace in your soul, yeah. because the Holy Spirit will trouble you if you get off the ladder, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and he, he'll make uh, idleness and sorrow and loneliness yeah. your food. If you don't get up on that longing for him, yeah. guess what? Satan comes by and starts tempting you. Yeah. He tempts you with the wantonness of, the, of this world, yeah. with the pride of life, with the lust of the flesh, with things and stuff. And that wantonness, where does it take you? Way off that ladder, that's for sure. Yeah. See, so you, you have to stay, I need you, Lord. Yes. I'm dull of mind and hard-headed. I need you, Lord. I'm, I'm giving you my speech, so you've got your own, I'm sure. But... Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that my head is thick and I need him to hit me real hard. So, be encouraged today. Be encouraged. Let me, let me I'm, I'm probably, yep, I'm almost out of time. <clears throat> let me read the next section here. It, um, and section one continued. So, the, the couple things that are important is that you recognize you're adopted and appreciate the privilege to call him Abba Father. Okay, that's so important in relationship. It, yes, God is all powerful. Yes, He could crush you uh, if He wanted to, but He's not chosen to do that. If He was going to crush you, He would have never sent Jesus. Keep that in mind. For those of you that suffer condemnation unjustly, if God was going to crush you, He would have never drawn you to Christ. Keep that in your heart. The Lord loves you. He loves you deeply. He loves you with all of His heart. And expects the same from you. Yes? yes? So remember your adoption. Don't be afraid to call him Abba. Because that is a great and wonderful and blessed privilege that we have. If you're a son, if you're a daughter, it's okay to call him Abba. That's the Hebrew word for father. And it's endearing in the, in the, in the context. So don't be afraid to celebrate your adoption. Yes. Yes. You're now in the family of God. And the promises of God are yes and amen to the family of God for those who believe in Christ Jesus. Yes? Yes. yes. And so in a broad context, um, our, the beginning of our transformation process is the divine choice. Yes, we talked about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. And that God is expectant of us leaning and longing for holiness in this earth, that you would walk circumspectly, that you would walk a walk that's worthy of the calling that you've received. And as we've learned in previous teachings on the subject of justification, no one is declared blameless, listen closely, no one 
is declared blameless before God by keeping the law. Justification in Jesus Christ is a, is a divine declaration by Almighty God over you in light of the sacrifice of His Son. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to the mercy, He saved us. Yes? Keep that in mind. It's not because you're special or because you preach good or you pray good or you serve well or you gave your house to the poor. Nonsense. It's rubbish before a great God and king. Yeah. Rubbish. Mm-hmm. It's, it's because we know that we can uh, only find satisfaction mm-hmm. in this life yeah. by accepting that God loves you. Yes. God chose you. Yeah. God has chosen to abide in you, and he's set for sure a place for you in heaven, yeah. and he's going to take you there. Thanks for letting me.